Good morning. My name is Steve, and this is Edna Prosser, my wonderful wife. And uh, we're here, Lord, <coughs> to recognize the veterans uh, here, in, here at church. This is Veterans Week, and uh, we thank you for uh, uh, the people who are online uh, watching. And uh, we would like for them, the veterans to stand, please, and re be recognized. I want to recognize Mr. Prosser. Tell them who you do their okay. stuff for. I, I am involved with an honor guard team here at in Indianapolis. We do uh, uh, funerals for veterans who, who have passed away. And uh, uh, we uh, have been doing this for a number of years. Uh, the pro, the, the, uh, we're Indy Metropolitan Military Honor Guard, or IMMHG. And... Uh, we are so proud of our veterans, and I would like to uh, a shout out to them and are in, in recognition for what they have done and have given their life. There's a saying that says that a, a veteran has written a check for his life to be cashed in at any time that it is needed. Now think about that. Uh, for those that have been lost in conflicts, from past years to present, um, it's quite a it's quite a, a volunteer obligation, and we would need to thank them for their service. And with that, we will go into prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you ever so much, Lord, for this this time. This time, Lord, it's been an honor to be able to pray for for uh, this congregation, my church family, uh, been attending, Ed and I both have been attending for many years, and we've grown so close, Lord, to these people that they are our family. And we ask you, Lord, to open hearts and minds and be receptive to the, the, the uh, message today on eternal security. The last two sermons have really been meat to chew on, as they say. And Lord, we uh, are so thankful that we get sermons like this that helps us grow and learn. And it's been our, it's been our privilege to be able to honor and praise you at, in all things. And Father, I thank you so very much for what you have done for me personally. Um, you brought me to this church about 33 years ago when my first husband was dying. And you haven't turned loose. You haven't, you've put people in my path to help me grow. And that's what a church family is all about. Help us all to help others to grow. Our scripture, this, this service, is all about what Jesus has done, which is... John 10, 28. I give eternal peace. I'm almost ready to change the words around. <laughs> they will never perish. And the, set, the last part is, no one can snatch them out of my hand. No one. Now, is that not a beautiful promise? Thank you, Father God. We love you so much. All these things we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate these guys a ton. Well, good morning. Welcome to Green New Christian. Uh, those who are joining us online, those who are here with us in person. A couple of things that we want to let you know about. One is... Um, we've known for the last couple of years that our good friends David and Kathy Strange are nearing retirement. 
uh, after uh, their time of service here at the church, and we want to honor them. Uh, if you can believe it, uh, David is completing 47 years of service on our staff here at Greenwood Christian, and I am not one ever to make fun of David or to hurt his feelings, and so I'm not going to point out the fact that that's longer than I've been alive on this planet. I would, I would never say that kind of thing to David, but Anyway, uh, we are just so thankful for their decades of faithful service, the ministry that God has done through them, through their family, through their marriage, um, and we just, we appreciate them so much. So we want to let you know, we've been planning for a couple of months uh, for a retirement celebration for them, and we want to let you know that that's coming up December 12th. Uh, we'll start at 6 p.m. here. We'll begin with a roast, I mean a program that will celebrate David, uh, and then we'll have a reception for them immediately following that. Uh, but it would just be a chance for us to tell stories, a chance for us to laugh together, and a chance for us to show them uh, how much we appreciate what they have allowed God to do through their lives here in this place. So we hope that you'll jump on the website. You can RSVP just so we have a, a sense of how many to plan for that day. We're looking forward to honoring David and Kathy and just saying thank you to them in December. And then, uh, as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, we are in a season right now where folks from our church are adopting families uh, for Christmas. It's an initiative we do year in and year out. Uh, we know there are just families in our community who are struggling for a myriad of different reasons, and we want to show them the love of Christ uh, in the midst of, of the challenge that they're dealing with. And so uh, we have uh, folks who are signing up on our website uh, to sponsor families, and that involves buying gifts for them. They'll, you'll know kind of what ages and genders they have of kids and some things they like and stuff like that. Uh, we have life groups who sign up to do that. We have families who sign up to do that. We have groups of friends who sign up. Uh, our family has signed up, and we're excited about the opportunity that we'll have to show the love of Christ to some folks. So we'd love, again, for you to get on the website and just join us in making a difference uh, in the lives of some folks in our community. And once you stand, let's continue to sing together today. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they Love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I who I am, who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, because you know. It's a love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak peace, so unexplainable, I, I can 
can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love
Good morning. My name is Matt, and I want to welcome all of you who are joining us this morning. It's great to see you here in person with us. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us online. And uh, I'll just say today has been a day when I've seen a number of people in person that I haven't seen in a while. I know there have been a number of different reasons why some of us have kept and continue to keep our distance. We absolutely respect that, but it's just great to see you in person. So if you're here with us today in person for the first time in a while, and I haven't had a chance to greet you yet, I would love to see you for a minute after the service. I promise not to lick your forehead or anything weird. Just want to say, hey, just so good to be with you be with you. It's great. Um, We're going to wrap up today this redemption series that we've been working our way through for the last few weeks, and we've been summarizing in terms of communication this series like this, that from start to finish, Scripture is the story of God's pursuit of a relationship with all people. Now, it is full of short-sighted human choices with painful consequences, and woven throughout is God's determination to save us. God loves and seeks us without depriving us of the dignity of making our own choice about him. On our back porch at home, we have a couple of geranium baskets hanging. And a few weeks ago, I was watering plants and I was startled as I was pouring water into this basket to have three baby birds come flapping their way out of this nest I didn't even realize was back there. So they dropped about six feet to the ground, and both of our very curious golden retrievers, you know, just were right there on top of things. I didn't want the birds to get hurt, so I tried to keep the dogs away with one hand while I'm trying to scoop the birds up with the other to put them back in the nest. Now, the birds, of course, couldn't tell the difference between a guy who's trying to help them and a big giant, you know, trying to crush them. So they're doing everything within their power to get away from me. So I'm chasing these little birds, trying to scoop one up and put it back in the nest, and about the time I would go to get the second one, I would come back and find the first bird had dropped out of the nest again. And so I I wish I had a video of this. It would have been really comical to look, but I did finally manage with our son Brendan's help to get our dogs back inside and return all three of the birds to the nest. Now, I wanted to save them, but it also wasn't 100% up to me. I needed a little bit of cooperation on their part. Now, we use the word save in a number of different ways. We try to save money any way we can. We save the leftovers after our meals. We applaud the efforts of our veterans, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, and others who work diligently to save people's lives. But when we talk about being saved or salvation in spiritual terms, we're talking about being rescued by God from aimless, purposeless living. We're talking about being saved by God from sin and death and hell. In the beginning, we've talked about this over the last few weeks, God created our world and he put in it a man and a woman that he charged with the responsibility of managing and populating it. And those people enjoyed this close, life-giving relationship with God and they were given only one restriction. But Satan entered the picture and he convinced them that God was holding out on them. He persuaded them to eat from the only off-limits tree in the entire garden and sin entered the picture and death along with it. And every person since has experienced the curse of mortality. God predicted in that moment that life would get harder, and it has. He also promised to send a Savior who would crush Satan once and for all. And he did. Jesus is that Savior. The central story of Scripture is that God put on flesh. He came here, he lived the perfect life that none of us ever have, and then he died a criminal's death on a cross in our place, for our sins, and then rose from the dead. And because Jesus took our punishment, he invites us, sinful and flawed and messed up as we are, to trust and follow him, and in the process, to be restored to a kind of fellowship with God that enables us to live forever, long after these bodies give out. That, in a nutshell, is what it means to be saved. Now, last week, we stressed that God invites all people to be saved, but he also allows us a choice. This week, actually tomorrow, we're going to read chapter 36 in the Core 52 study, and that chapter is going to raise the question of eternal security, which we might phrase like this. Okay, once we are saved, are we always saved? I mean, is it possible for me to let go of my salvation? If, if salvation is God's gift to me, is it a gift that I'm capable of giving back? And depending on whom you ask, you're going to get different answers to that question because this is not a realm in which all Christians agree. And that's okay. Because we are saved by our faith in Jesus. We are not saved on the basis of our answer to this particular question. 
Scripture sometimes makes statements that exist in tension. They're paradoxical. They seem to oppose one another, and yet they're both true. So let me take a moment to illustrate what I mean by tension in general, and then we'll unpack this specific tension together. You may or may not have realized that last Sunday was not only Halloween, it was also Reformation Sunday. It was the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation that was sparked in 1517 by Martin Luther. And I saw several of my friends make posts on Facebook last Sunday that included words like these. They said things like, we are saved by scripture alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. Now, I get the point of what's being said there. The point is, we know about the message of salvation only because of the Bible. And salvation is possible only because God is gracious. And we are saved not by our behavior, but only through our trust in Jesus. And only Jesus has ever lived a sinless life. Only Jesus has ever returned from the dead. So only he is qualified to save us. The ultimate purpose of our lives and God's restoration of our lives is to glorify God. But when you take five alone statements and you put them side by side, none of them is truly alone anymore, is it? It's kind of like saying, I lost weight by exercise alone and by diet alone. Both of those statements matter, and neither of them stands alone. They exist in tension. A couple of weeks ago, Matt Bean preached to us from Ephesians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul wrote, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are made right with God, not through our good behavior, but through our trust in his mercy. There is absolutely no do-it-yourself approach to salvation. So people sometimes look at that and they conclude, well, as long as we believe the right things, I guess it makes no difference how we live. And yet the very next thing Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 is this. He said, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Religious behavior is not what saves us. The grace of Jesus does that. But the purpose of our lives is to honor God by doing good. Our good works are the evidence of our salvation. They are not the cause of it. But both our faith and our actions matter. There's a tension there. And I would suggest this morning that this question of eternal security is another point of tension because on the one hand, there are several texts that suggest salvation can never be lost. For example, Jesus said in John chapter 6, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Jesus said in John chapter 10, this is the verse that Edna alluded to earlier. It's one we're going to read together tomorrow. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all of those beautiful, powerful texts stress the truth that God clings to us. Once we come to Jesus, he will never stop loving us. He's never going to tell us to get lost. He's never going to send us packing. No one can tear us away from him. And I'm thankful for those promises. At the same time, those promises sit in tension with several other texts that suggest that salvation can be let go of. For example, Jesus said in John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So Jesus urges us to remain in him because it is evidently possible that we might not remain in him. 
In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul used a very similar tree analogy. To an audience of both Jewish and Gentile believers, Paul wrote that many of the people of Israel were broken off because of unbelief, and yet you, he said to the Romans, stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, Paul wrote, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, meaning the the people of Israel who had access to God's promises about the Messiah first, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So in this text, Paul emphasized both the kindness of God and the possibility that unbelief, that abandonment of our faith, could lead to disconnection from Christ. Paul wrote to the Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then because there were some in that particular church who were trying to tie their salvation to their meticulous keeping of all the Old Testament Jewish laws, Paul went on to say this, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. So apparently if we know about Jesus but we still try to save ourselves by following rules, we can actually fall away from Jesus. Paul urged his friend Timothy to fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. So it sounds like faith is something that is both rejectable and wreckable. Now later in that same letter, Paul wrote, the Spirit clearly says, That in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Would the Holy Spirit predict something that isn't even possible? Now, all of these texts urge us to cling to God. None of them suggest that there's anything wrong or anything lacking or deficient about God's love or his grace. They simply acknowledge that God allows us a choice about him. There's something I've noticed. I don't know if this has been an observation of yours, but in our neighborhood, there are several different ponds. Most of those ponds have signs posted around the perimeter, and those signs prohibit things like boating and ice skating. There are no warnings on any of those signs about sharks. Maybe your neighborhood is different, but that warning is not there in ours. I have never seen a do not enter sign posted on a wall with no door. I've never even once bothered to advise my kids about what they ought to do if they're out and about with their friends and they suddenly encounter a dinosaur. Just doesn't even come up. Because we only give warnings about things that are actual threats. Why would scripture warn us at all, let alone repeatedly, about falling away if falling away isn't even possible? See, scripture stresses that God clings to us and will not let go, and it also stresses that we need to cling to God, and there is a tension there. So what do we do with that tension? I can tell you right now, we're not going to resolve that question maybe to our complete satisfaction, but I think here are some practical things with this very real biblical tension that we ought to do. Number one, we need to know that God wants us to be saved even more than we do. I said last week that some people look at John 6, where Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Some people look at those words and they take that to mean that our salvation waits for one specific moment when God personally calls us to Jesus, only for some of us, that moment may never happen because God ultimately only calls certain people. But Jesus also said, for God so loved the world, remember that's everyone, that he gave his one and only son that whoever, that's anyone who believes in him, anyone who chooses to trust him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus later said in the Gospel of John, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, and that is not a statement about worship, that is a statement about crucifixion. The very next verse makes that clear. Jesus says, when I am nailed to a cross and lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people, not just a select few, but all people to myself. Jesus came to earth and he died for all people, in order to draw all people to him. He took all the initiative and he does all the heavy lifting to save us. Now, a second thing we need to acknowledge, I think, is that God gives us a choice. 
God gave Adam and Eve a choice in the beginning, and he gives us a choice today. Without choice, love isn't really love. Unless there's a choice, worship isn't really worship. In this week's Core 52 reading, Mark Moore is going to point out to us that marriage without the choice to love is really a lot more like human trafficking. That being forced to work with someone isn't really a business partnership. That's actually called slavery. See, love and worship are only genuine. They're, really, they're only possible when they're heartfelt and they're chosen. So let me just ask you, do you know anyone who at one time in their life professed to love and follow Jesus, but who doesn't any longer? I do. I can think of students I've worked with in youth ministry in the past. I can think of folks who were once engaged in churches that I've served. I can think of, think of some others who were raised in the church. But at this moment in their lives, they're not following Jesus. And some people would suggest that the issue is that these people were probably never saved to begin with. But listen with me to this text from Hebrews chapter 6. It says, it is impossible. That's a strong word. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. See, those verses are not talking about people who thought briefly about Christianity and then decided to pass and move on. This is talking about people who knew Jesus, people who experienced the Holy Spirit, people who walked with the Lord and then for whatever reason chose to say goodbye. Now, I'm not suggesting that that happens quickly, I'm not suggesting it happens easily. I'm not suggesting that that happens often or without significant wrestling with God. And it certainly is not my point. It is absolutely not my place to judge anybody else's salvation. But scripture talks of a very real possibility that a person can truly know the Lord and then decide to walk away. God gives us a choice. So we need to choose wisely. The third thing I would toss out to us is I think it's important that we be aware of the way that our own biases flavor our thinking. For example, if we put greater emphasis on God's holiness and his wrath than we do on his love and his mercy, we create, we cultivate a climate of spiritual insecurity. This constant fear that if we sin one more time, God is going to kick us to the curb. And that would be tragic. Because Paul said in Romans 8 that there is now no condemnation. Not just a little bit less condemnation. There is zero condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sins have been wiped away, not by our improved moral behavior, but by the blood of Jesus. At the same time, though, our desire to indulge ourselves and yet still be saved may cause us to want to focus on certain texts that are all about God's love and grace and mercy while we completely ignore and disregard those that confront sin. And Paul spoke to that too. When he asked, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul actually answered his own question. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? See, in Scripture, God assures us of his relentless faithfulness and he warns us against falling away. And it's very tempting for us to take one or the other of those camps and just sort of call that our home and completely disregard the other. But biblical faithfulness requires us to embrace and live in the tension. Our salvation depends on Jesus. It does not depend on us. And yet a relationship with God does involve a choice on our part. So we need to be reminded how powerfully God loves us how determinedly God pursues us. And at the same time, we need to be challenged not to let go of him. We need to look at all of scripture, not just the parts that are most comfortable for us, not just the parts that best reinforce the position that we would really like to hold. At the end of the day, I think we can safely say this, that we cling to God as he holds on to us. 
we cling to him, he holds on to us. No matter our circumstances, we need to cling to Jesus. Maybe you've noticed that when life gets really hard, you know, when a loved one dies, or a spouse walks out the door, or a job gets eliminated, or the doctor delivers a tough diagnosis, that we are sometimes tempted in those moments to, to question God and, and blame him and walk away from him. By the same token, when life is going really well, when we're happy and we're healthy and we're employed and we're comfortable and our car is running well, we're sometimes tempted to think, you know what? I've got this. I mean, I might hit a rough patch and need God down the road at some point, but for now, I think I'm good. And whatever the reason, whatever the circumstances that take us there, taking our eyes off of Jesus is always dangerous. Now, we could sit down over a cup of coffee and we can debate all day long whether we can forfeit our salvation or not. But the question today isn't just whether we'll go to heaven. It's whether our lives are focused on God's purposes for us. Whether we are becoming more like Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about so much more than just hell insurance. Jesus invites us to come to him to be saved and to be transformed and to be used by him in drawing others to him. So at all times, we simply need to urge all people to cling to Jesus. And that means that if you have never committed your life to Jesus before, if perhaps today is the first time you've ever walked through the door of a church building, I want to invite you today to come to Jesus and cling to him. Maybe you've been in church your entire life. That would be more like me. We need to come to Jesus and cling to him. Maybe you've been spiritually adrift for a while and you are now wanting to bring your, your life back around. You're wanting to find your way back. If that describes you, I would just invite you to come to Jesus and cling to him. For the first time, for the 500th time, come to Jesus. Cling to him. We cling to God as he holds on to us. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, come to Jesus. Life isn't found anywhere else. So we want to help you know him. We want to help you follow him. We exist as a church to help each other follow Jesus. If that means you need to be obedient and be baptized into him, we're ready to help you do that. We want to help you live for him. We want to help each other remain in him. So whatever questions you have, whatever next step you're ready to take, we would love to talk and pray with you. And at any time, whether you're watching this right now or you're catching this online a little bit later in the day or a little bit later in the week, at any time, you can simply text the word NEXT to, to the number 317-707-9997. And we will get back with you very quickly. We'd love to have a conversation. You let us know what's on your heart. We'd love to talk. And if you happen to be here in the room on campus with us in person right now, it's even easier. In just a moment, you can just make your way to the back. Just find us at the back center doors. There will be a few of us back there, and we would love to have a conversation right here, right now, about anything that God is impressing upon your heart. God loves us in a way we can't even begin to describe, in a way that refuses to quit. He invites us into relationship with him, and he invites us to cling to him. That's a tension we need to live in. And so I'm so grateful we get to spend some time together this morning. If we can help you to take a next step, if we can pray with you or answer questions about anything at all that you're wrestling with, we'd love to. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us. Father, thank you for the immensity of your love, just the determination, your, your persistence, Father, in, in seeking us and pursuing a connection with us. We thank you for the sacrifice the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your spirit and your word and the example of your people and the ongoing challenge, Father, we find um, everywhere we turn, just urging us to cling to you as you hold on to us. Father, we ask that rather than seeing some of these things we've looked at this morning as a basis for argument with people, Father, help us to simply recognize how much you love us, how much we need you, and Father, to to respond to that simply by seeking you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. In the next few moments in our service, you get a very concrete opportunity to cling to Jesus. Uh, we're entering into our time of communion, and so we've got eight stations around the room. 
Uh, there at those stations, you'll find uh, two cups together. One has bread, one has juice, and those represent the body and blood of our Savior given for us so that we can have a relationship with God. Uh, so we're going to sing a song whenever you are ready. You are welcome to head to one of those stations and spend a little bit of time um, with our Savior. I hear the Savior of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid all all to him I own sin and left a crimson stain he washed and wiped us Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain, he washed it white. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin and left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. this week in community with Jesus in your life. Amen. Who is this